back with another episode of the Branders Magazine Talking with Branders podcast. I'm your host, Tima Bacanza, and today, coming at us from our studio on the other side of the world is the one and only James Bonad. Hopefully I pronounced your name right. We had a whole conversation about that. Uh, he's a designer. He's an educator. And if you did not pick up our December 2023 issue of Branders Magazine, uh, well, you're missing out because James is on our cover and he gives such an insightful, insightful interview um, on his career Stop and his it. background. So w- welcome to the Stop studio, it. James. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, yeah, good pronunciation of my surname there. Um, I like the British accent. Well done. I appreciate that. It's not uh, Bernard. It's not Bernard. It's James Barnard. So well done. Thanks very much. Uh, I, 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 how to talk English good is going to be the name of my book, right? Like... <laughs> Speak good England, as my wife would say. Uh, well done. Uh, James, for those of us listening who have no idea who you are because they've been living under a rock for many, many, many years, uh, can you give everyone like a 30 to 60 second elevator pitch on on yourself? Sure. Uh, Yeah, my name is James Barnard. Uh, I live (laughs) in Australia, Gold Coast, Australia, um, but I'm from the UK. I am a seasoned freelancer. Um, I work from home, so you're going to hear a lot of background noise. Uh, it's 7 a.m. in the morning right now, trying to get on the on the call with you in the East Coast. It's just uh, the worst time of day. But um, you're going to hear my kids screaming in the background right now. This is like peak time for them. They're getting ready for school, having their breakfast. So you'll definitely hear them screaming. Um, yeah, I, I work from home. I deal with clients all over the world, though. So the beauty of being a freelancer is I can deal with absolutely anybody on any kind of time frame. And I deal with, um, you know, brands from the likes of the states from europe all over the place designing logos uh, for the last something like nearly 15 years um i am also uh, a design educator i still need to come up with a good title for this but i i've had a lot of success on social media teaching what i know passing the knowledge on to the next generation of designers uh specifically within the software and the logo industry and the freelance industry yeah. so yeah that's my elevator pitch uh well done and we appreciate all the work that you do in helping to get that next generation up to par right get them to where they need to be and and like you james uh i'm at home and uh, you have kids waking up and i got a kid probably coming home from school in like the next 20 to 30 minutes but you know what uh it doesn't matter because we're going to push out great content and that is all that matters so um love that you are just so honed in on your craft, right? And that is something that I admire, right? As I'm not a designer. I'm a frustrated creative director. Uh, like I'm a frustrated golfer. Like I'm a frustrated bocce player. Um, kind of the story of my life. I'm just frustrated. <laughs> uh, but obviously, you know, being on the strategy side of things, I work hand in hand with designers. I work, I speak the language of creative. Um, you... And, and and just having read up on on you and just really knowing your career, I have a slew of questions I'm going to ask. But I think the first and foremost one is going to be around misconceptions. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of misconceptions out there when it comes to branding. Um, but what are some of the most common misconceptions you get from being a logo designer or being a visual designer that you just want to like debunk right at the get go? You're, you're lifting directly from my magazine article already. I absolutely love it. I, could, I should just read the magazine. I've got it here. Um, misconceptions just around like pulling one out from the magazine just to set it nice. up, and then Thanks. from there we're going to use a launch. Then you're going to attack me with the hard questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the biggest misconception around logo design is that people think it's easy because everything yeah. looks simple. Um, you know, one of the biggest um, issues with being a freelancer as a logo designer is getting paid well, and people don't seem to value um logo design as much as they probably should because it looks so easy to do people assume it's going to be cheap so one of the biggest problems i have is is actually getting trying to extract a little bit more from a client Mm -hmm. um, specifically when they're you know sort of like a mom and pop shop and they don't have that much money to spend convincing them to spend a bit more because it's not easy being a logo designer um my job is to take you know a litany of problems um beliefs values from a client's brand, roll it into a ball and spit out this one single symbol that represents their industry at a glance and their brand values and their ethos uh, as like a a unique symbol. And if it looks anything like anything that's been done before on this planet, then we can't use it. 
Um, so it's it's a, it's tough and it's not easy to get there. And logo design often takes weeks and weeks and weeks to extract a good concept or idea out of a client and, to, and actually bring it to to paper. So yeah, um, it's not easy. That's that's it's not easy. Misconception. Yeah. I, so I, I and I started off with the softball question uh, by design. <laughs> uh, why do you call yourself from a positioning perspective like? I hear you call yourself a logo designer, not a graphic yeah. designer, not visual identity, not any other fancy term, but you just go logo designer. Why? Yeah. Yeah. I knew this was going to be a contentious issue. Uh, I get this question a lot from um, designers, especially as like strategists. The, the main answer is, is because it's the easiest way to explain what I do to clients. So if I go to a party and someone asks me, what do you do? I'm, like, oh, I'm a visual identity designer. They're like, what do you mean? Yeah. Uh, I design logos. I'm like, oh yeah, okay. Well, just say that then. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, mm -hmm. it's honestly, it's like, it's kind of cuts the bullshit. Um, yeah. And also from like an SEO perspective, it's really kind of smart to call myself a logo designer, right? When people are searching for uh, freelance logo designer, I think I come up pretty near the top because I mentioned that a lot in my website. Yeah. And it really, really helps when actually attracting new clients. Um, I can do the rest of the, you know, all the bells and whistles, the visual identity that you and I would, you, you know, you and I would call my job a visual identity designer. I can do the background patterns. I can do the extra bits and pieces that need you need to build a brand as part of a visual identity. Um, but I just start with the logo design as the first part of that sale. And it's kind of like a sales funnel for me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If they come to me for the logo, then I might upsell them on some more services. And as a freelancer, that's brilliant because I've been there and done that. I've done everything from magazine design to website design to a little bit of video animation. So I could probably cover most of what you need mm -hmm. um, just completely because of my experience. Yeah, I, I think the, the key part, what you just said, James, is you're cutting out the bullshit, right? Sometimes, a lot of times, uh, us branders uh, want to complicate things. You know, we want to make ourselves sound romantic or we want to make ourselves sound more important than we are. But just fucking say it how it is. I make logos. I build messages. I write taglines, whatever that is. And and so smart of you to bring up seo and this is something that me being uh you know i'm not completely an x-shaped marketer but i'm kind of like to think of myself as a little bit x-shaped uh having mm -hmm. done so many things over the course of the last 20 years um i think a lot of you know um not too many designers are thinking with seo in the back of their mind right. or like just like if someone hits my website do they know what i do in the first five seconds you know what i mean and mm -hmm. like yeah uh, so, so so smart of you to do that when you were getting started did you think of yourself as a logo designer or were your aspirations bigger I'm going to be a creative director or something like that. Uh, the, y yes, you're absolutely right. That latter term, the creative director. That when I first got my my very first role in graphic design was at a magazine, and I got asked that question in the interview, like, "Where do you see yourself in five years?" And I was like, "I want to be a creative director. I want to do all of this, um, the overarching stuff. I want to be leading a design team." And as things progressed in my career, I realized that's just not the case. I mm -hmm. love the design portion so much. The, the, the second that I reached the point in my career where I was in the managerial, I got up to like head of digital design for um, the marketing team for a national newspaper. I hated it. I absolutely despised the role because I was dealing, I was putting out fires all the time. Yeah. I was dealing with managerial issues and honestly little bits of HR issues, just dealing with people. Um, people. And I was yeah. relinquishing the actual design portion of my um, role. And, and I, I Hated it. I think I lasted something like six weeks in that role because I was just mm. so demoralized with not doing the design work anymore. Um, that I was like, right, I went freelance to find before finding a new job. And then when I went freelance, I did nothing but design. I worked for agencies across London. I worked for my own clients. I was just so hands on. I was like, this is what I want to do. Eventually, the logo design thing came from sort of the experience as being a graphic designer. I realized yeah. that logo design and visual identity is like the it's like the start point it's like working with a blank canvas building something from scratch from just an idea there's nothing um more rewarding to me than that it's like the, the start point of this um company is this blank canvas and i can just draw and create 
and I absolutely love it. It took me a long, a long time to get to that point to realize that that was what I wanted to do. Um, but when I realized that, it was kind of all guns blazing. And, um, and like we mentioned, I went back to my website. I ripped everything off my website that wasn't to do with um, visual identity or logo design. I changed um, the, a lot of the keywords on the site. I rewrote the website just to focus on the SEO side of things and very very quickly my website shot to the top mm -hmm. um, i was living in london at the time freelance logo designer london i was number one and that immediately led to all sorts of leads and um you know in incoming leads from directly from seo which was fantastic and so again all roads back all roads are going back to seo and they're going back to top yeah. funnel right you're owning That's your right. top funnel low and mm -hmm. i and it's actually kind of like i'm sitting here thinking about it kind of brilliant that you use it as you know um you get you, you you get them with the logo design, and then it's everything else that comes after. But you're not overcomplicating it by saying I'm going to give you everything. That's overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of brands, smaller brands, they don't know what they don't know what they don't know. Number one, and they yeah. don't know what they need. And I think you know, safe to assume, and perhaps I'd like you to elaborate, is like in the logo process, how much are you uncovering more ways for the brand to come to life that they never even thought about? Well, that the initial, because I've I've targeted that sort of SEO term, I am working with a certain type of client, and and I am a freelancer. I'm not an agency, so I can't really expect to be working with global corporations. Although sometimes I do, yeah. Um, but you know, the large majority of my clients are these um, one or two man bands who've started their businesses with a crappy logo, and they've real they've exploded and they've gotten bigger and they've come to the um, point where they realize they need something a little bit better. Um, that is like, that's where I kind of come in. And then it gets to the point where we, you know, we get on the phone and I'll try and extract a bit more from them. I'll ask them questions about their brand, like silly questions. Like if your design, if your brand was a celebrity, what celebrity would they be? I don't know. Yeah. That. That's like, that's not one for the financial corporations, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's, that, it's my job to kind of extract everything I can to provide them with a logo that they're going to be proud of. And that I'm going to be proud of, right. It's going on my portfolio as well. Yeah. Um, and to do that, we've got to kind of, in my opinion, we've got to get some meaning into this design. And that's one of the um, things I, th I think I excel at is, is incorporating meaning behind the company and values into this one single symbol so that when they look at their logo over the years, they are proud of it and um, that the design actually means something to them and it actually represents their business. And they've been a part of the process, the, the actual creative process as well. So that's really Yeah, important. I mean, it, it totally gives them like the sense of pride, the sense of ownership and like, in a way, right? Legacy, right? That's why they're building mm -hmm. a business for something yeah. bigger, something better, something with longevity, and you're able to to provide that. Uh, in the branding circle, right? We always hear branding is not your logo. Branding is not your logo. <laughs> what is it? True. Ah, uh, I, I get this all the time. So I, I share a lot of my work on social media, and um, you know I, I'm a, I'm big on the meaning behind the logo, and I put a lot of thought into what goes behind it. And then one of the biggest, you know, most common comments I get is, so the client will know the meaning behind the logo, but the customer doesn't. Like, what does that mean? If 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 you have to explain it to a customer, then surely it's kind of lost the point. You know, a brand is like what who your company is what your company says to the world it's not a logo meaning goes into your logo over time like the starbucks logo is a siren it has nothing to do with coffee um why does why is that logo so synonymous with that brand and it's the work that they've put into that to associate that meaning and feeling into that visual representation of their business now it helps if the logo looks trustworthy and premium enough to separate you from your competition. And I think that's one of the reasons why people do value a good stylish premium looking logo is because it, it might separate you from the competition. It mm -hmm. might instill trust and convince the customer to tip over into that sale. Um, so it's, it's a tricky one. Th there are good looking logos and there are bad looking logos and you can tell them apart instantly. And you instantly, if you saw two businesses, one with a crappy logo and one with a good one, you'd go to the one with a good one. And in, in, in especially in industries where, you know, the um, competition is just kind of, it's, it's a saturated market, having a good logo separates you and can really help. Mm -hmm. So give me an example of logos. Like are, are 
what do you here? I'm gonna re, I'm gonna rephrase this one, James. Uh, <laughs> you meet a you meet a, a a business and they think that their logo and their visual identity is just amazing because their son did it. <laughs> their son created it. Uh, but now that they've come to you, you met them at a party and they say, Oh my God, look at this business card that my son designed. Are you truthful from your expert level? Or do you kind of placate them a little bit and, and kind of random question, but curious on how you approach this. I, um, what's the, how do I put this? I'm truthful to an extent. <clears throat> it's not my job to critique somebody else's design. And I get asked this a lot online. It's like, can you, what do you think of this logo? What do you think of that logo? And I, I specifically don't comment because, you know, if an agency is putting a logo out into the world and the public doesn't like it, it's not my job to explain why. Um, they've been through rounds of amends. But when, when a, a, a somebody comes to me and, um, like this happened to me the other day, this guy who's launching a business in Australia showed me a logo that he's just run with and it was between you and me and the rest of the world. I hope he's not listening. Uh, it sucked. It was it was awful. It, it didn't mean anything. It was this kind of stylized. It, it broke a lot of the rules of logo design. It didn't scale well. So that's the kind of thing I say to them. Is just, I say, look, oh, if, you know, if you're proud of it, then fantastic. But just think about how this design is going to scale on this, on you know when it is put onto a pen top or used on a favicon in a website. Yeah. Uh, does it work well in one color? You can start to talk to them about the principles and the good rules of thumb with logo design to kind of show them maybe your logo design isn't meeting all that. Right, criteria. right. You're almost like pointing like them to... in, the, in the direction of them exactly. coming to the conclusion yeah. themselves. Exactly right. And then, you know, I can help with that. Here's my business card. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Oh, so that's an interesting question. What does your business card look like? Is it? I is don't it... have one. I, that was just me <laughs> saying it. I don't have a business card. Who has one these days? I mean, um, I haven't given yeah, out a it's... business card since COVID. I feel that's like that's right. Here's my <laughs> NFC tag. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> um, you talk about the rules of logo design. Obviously, it's got to scale. It's got to work with multiple colors. And I'm saying obviously, like everyone listening, you know, understands this. But like, what are some of the what are the written rules of logo design? And perhaps are some unwritten rules of logo design well okay so there's like you, you can talk about this in two ways you can talk about like what makes a good logo and what are the rules um I, i'm actually working with a client right now where i designed a logo for them and i I, I stuck to the rules. It scales well. It works really well in a small format. It has variations of the logo that scale when the mediums get bigger. So for instance, you start with a great logo mark as, as part of that. And then as the design perhaps gets a bit wider, like a bigger poster, you've got a variation that can scale up to that. It works well in one color. It has a variation that prints in white and it prints in black. Um, and then you can go to sort of more overarching kind of guidelines on logo design. Like, is it unique? Um, is it, does it look trustworthy? Does it reflect your industry? Um, is it timeless? You know, in 10 years time, yeah. are you going to still pr be proud of this logo? Or are you going to want to change it? Um, I chatted with, um, Alan Peters about this is one of my heroes, like the king of the, of the badge. Um, he, when he tackles a logo project, the last thing he does is he asks himself the question, okay, in 10 years time, when I come back to this, how can I make it simpler? How can I reduce it down? And in that way, he's coming, he's getting to a logo that is the most reductive representation of a brand, as simple as humanly possible, without plagiarizing on anybody else's work. And that's a huge part of it. Is like the more simple you get, the more likely it is going to look like somebody else's design. So um, it's tricky. You have to kind of find that sweet spot between simple and unique. And in my opinion, those are the logos that are timeless. How do you achieve unique though? Like. I love Austin Kleon's book, Steal yeah. Like an Artist. Right? Yeah. You're drawing yeah. from other inspiration, but like it's completely unique. Like that's a tension right there that mm -hmm. that's a hell of a tension. How, how do you how do you go through that? Yeah, that's the trickiest part is um getting to a design and realizing, oh, this is brilliant. Why is it brilliant? Oh, it looks like the Nike logo. You know, it's it's so hard to get to a reductive design that hasn't treaded on anybody else's toes. And one of the ways I kind of um, combat this is by splicing two ideas together. So mm -hmm. again, I stole from Alan Peters on this. He has this wonderful process um, with clients called the brand noun process. So he will oh, yeah. get the client to pre-approve five objects, things that, um, that we're allowed to use in the design phase. 
And then maybe he'll splice two of those together to form a completely new shape um, that then has both meaning and is unique. <clears throat> it's not easy to do. And um, typically, like logo type designs, um, logos that are the word mark will be by in the, the nature of the, the shape completely unique anyway, because you're working with a piece of type. Um, it's, it is really, really tough. I have, I have loads of um, processes in place at the end of um, when I've come to a sort of flat vector and I've made it in black and white, I will drag and drop it into the WIPO database and do a, a reverse image search against trademark designs to see if anything comes up. Google Images is great for that. There are other resources as well. But it's like um, it's a big part of, the, of my process is making sure that I haven't stepped on anybody else's toes. And you're right, Austin Cleon does say you should steal other people's uh, <laughs> work, but uh, it is uh, it is really tough and. Um, I, I chatted to a, a, an illustrator called Von Glitschker about this. Um, he has a course on um, anti sort of, uh, sort of trademarking your work and, and putting it out to sort of the local authorities that this is your design and registering it for trademark so that you know, your work doesn't get stolen from other people. Yeah. But it's a huge job. And it's like, a, it's like you know, there'll be a, a full time job trying to police that. So um, right. you kind of have to, to create a design that is unique. Um, and isn't as close to, to somebody else's work as possible. Obviously, you're still going to tread on people's toes from time to time, but of course, um, you, you do your best. Yeah, but I, I think that that level of thought process behind it and knowing that you're doing your due diligence, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that's something that's definitely setting you apart as a designer. I think a lot of designers would they're okay with good enough. They're okay with not necessarily checking the database. And I mean, I've worked on projects with designers where it's a V, but if you look at it this way, it's the Adidas logo or the Adidas <laughs> logo. It's like, well, hmm, you know what I mean? Or I've seen that mark on Dribble, or I've seen that mark here, there, everywhere. And like, you know, well, like, at the end of the day, it's as good as your legal team is, isn't it? You know, um, right. the Airbnb logo, uh, the Meta logo, they look awfully similar to designs they certainly do. in the past. But um, who's going to sue Facebook, you know, um, for bleach? For, Airbnb for... should. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Talk about that legal sense. battle, right? The battle of the logos. <laughs> yeah. It's like Celebrity Deathmatch. I don't know if you remember that show from back I in the do. day. MTV, um, yeah. That's actually funny. Like, like Deathmatch, like logo Deathmatch, where logos like just kind of fighting each other. That's a new Instagram account. We should, account we <laughs> I think we just started a business, James. <laughs> yeah, nice. yeah, that's what we need is, is, is another another project to work on. Um, <laughs> I read a quote from you about finding meaning in the abstract. Mm -hmm. What the hell does that mean for, for designers out there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I mean, like, let's say... Um, like the Toblerone logo, for instance, is, is yeah. like this pyramid, but there's a bear in the middle of it. Like, uh, what does that really mean? Uh, it's it's tough. It's tough. Like, one of the hardest parts about um, logo design is actually coming up with unique ideas. And sometimes those ideas are so, um, like a concept behind the design can't just be in your face because it's been done too many times. Like, for instance, I did a logo for a childcare center in the UK and they wanted, you know, themes around child play like teddy bears and building blocks and if i did a logo with a teddy bear in it that would be so um so done be done to death yeah how can we how can we represent this in an abstract way that works in a small format as a logo and the result of that project you can go check it out on my website it's one of my sort of crowning achievements i think it's one of the best logos i've ever done um because it's so reductive and it combines two elements together to represent something new. And that's, I love when logos like that work and they come together. Um, yes, they need branding and they need messaging to apply meaning to that logo. But at the end of the day, that client is hugely proud of that design. And another thing as well is that, you know, when, it, when a customer comes along and they go, what's your logo about? And they get to explain that meaning to a, a client or a customer. They love it. It absolutely makes their day. Yeah. So when you've got something that's, you know, a bit of meaning that's hidden in a design, it might not be in your face immediately, but when you look a little bit closer and it reveals itself, that is so satisfying, especially for a client because they, they're proud of it and they get to explain it. And it just, it just helps the logo last a bit longer that when they have that pride in this design, it will, it will stand the test of time. And that's hugely important. It's, it's like you are 
you're very much taking like a strategy POV to your logo design because you're like, you're finding insight and then insight, people get the term insight grossly wrong, right? It's not an observation. It's not a piece of data, right? It is the why behind the why behind the why behind the why. It's like that really interesting, provocative thing that makes you go, huh? Right. And like something yeah. like the FedEx logo, where there's an arrow in there that that signifies movement and 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 whatnot. You can never unsee it, but it's like so smart that whoever yeah. came up with that, it's just so smart. And and do you often think of finding this sticky insight or is it just kind of innately come to you? Like, is that a process that you engage with or is it just you do it? Yeah. It's, it is hard. I, I do like to try and do it. It doesn't work with every single client. You know, it's, it's not something that is that I feel like I have to include as part of a logo design. But boy, is it amazing when it comes out. And but that process takes weeks to yeah. evolve. You know, it's like it, part of my job is pattern recognition and seeing the meaning where there isn't any. And that's that takes years to master by kind of brute forcing it, just right, just sketching down line connections. I, I, I'm terrible at sketching as well, by the way. That's one of my things. I'm absolutely mm. rubbish at drawing. I'm into the software as fast as possible. But I do do sketching because it's faster and I can do line connections and to try and spot a shape or a, a bit of meaning inside um, two shapes combined together. Um, like I say, those Easter eggs, they're not, you don't need them in a design, but I've kind of made a bit of a name for myself for doing it now, incorporating meaning into the abstract. And like you said, the FedEx logo, it will work whether it had that hidden arrow in it or not, because they've applied meaning to that logo and that logo represents their brand over a, a sort of longer period of time. But like you say, when, when you go, when you look a little bit closer and you spot something in there, that's incredible. And that just kind of blows people's minds. And, and, and that's a huge part of what I'm trying to do when I create a logo is, is to just to keep revealing meaning and to keep showing um, ethos and, and values right. just in this one single symbol, which is really hard to do. But when it works, it's just like chef's kiss. It's no, exactly. And going, going back to that initial, you know, that misconception that it's easy, this logo mark, whatever it is, has to carry so it has so much responsibility for the brand you know mm -hmm. and it has to it's got to carry its purpose its vision it's got to carry the reasons to believe like everything that you think of from a strategic from a brand strategy point of view it's got to that's the bow tie the chef's kiss like that is that thing yeah. on top and uh uh you, you know it's it's so you know in in, in the branding world i think the brand strategy has been that trending topic of recently. Uh, but at the end of the day, <laughs> you're still judging a book by its cover, right? Like you're still Absolutely. judging a brand by the logo. Yeah. It's, it's tough as well because there was this study done by the American um, Marketing Association that found that like descriptive logos have a more positive effect on sales. And that's, that's constantly on my mind while I'm designing. Like, a logo for a burger joint should probably have a burger in it, right? And whether there's meaning in that or not, a logo should really reflect the industry. And this is one of the hardest parts is A, incorporating meaning in the abstract, but at the same time, at a glance, that design needs to reflect the industry. Um, you know, if, if a hairdresser logo looks like a car company, you've immediately right. failed at what you're trying to do. So that's another side of things that const you constantly have to consider is that, does this logo reflect the space that it's in? Um, and that's really tough to do. It's, it's always on my mind. And I sometimes feel like I haven't quite nailed that with my logo projects, if I'm being completely honest. Like, yes, there's meaning in there. But if you glanced at that logo just off the off the cuff and just saw it for the first time, would you know that it's a restaurant? Would you know that it's a content creation company? It's, it's really hard to do. Right. And I, and, I, and I feel like, again, not a designer here, but I feel like that's something you're always striving for but you'll never michael beirut hasn't mastered that you know what i yeah. mean like that's that's, that's unmasterable <laughs> i agree yeah. yeah it's really tricky uh except for except if you're ai ai has mastered it and now we're oh. all out of a job right no 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 don't, no, don't no. wake them up yet what's your <laughs> is that key, <laughs> don't wake the robots up steven are uh, <laughs> is ai keeping you up at night a little bit yeah, mm -hmm. it's a scary time right now, isn't it? I think I've I've talked about this a lot before. I think I'm I'm reasonably safe at the moment because AI is not great at concepting. It, it 
doesn't work well in the abstract. You have to tell it what to do. And that's yeah. what's going to set me apart. Like you need to instruct it. I, I have worked with AI to kind of help me conceptualize ideas before. And full disclosure, I, I, I used chat GPT once to come up to help me brainstorm ideas for a logo. Um, I, I need a logo for a civil engineering company that uses the initials KE in the monogram. What do I do? And just to, just for shits and giggles, I just typed that in just to see what happened. And most of the ideas were like properly cliched and, and yeah. rubbish. But one idea it said was to use the K as a corner brace. I was like, ah, oh, that's, that's quite good. It still took my skill as a designer to, to extract that logo that, out. Yeah. Um, and to get, you know, that last 20, 25%. Um, which is one of is another one of the things as well, which is why I think we're we're safe is that yes, AI is out there, but it's a tool for designers to use. Civil you will always get better results than civilians will. Um, and the results won't be perfect, but it'll take a designer to push it that last 10% into a perfect product. Yeah. Um whether it's removing the six fingers on one hand or you know, taking the glean off things. But um, yeah. We designers will always, it's, it's a tool for designers for, for us to use. It speeds yeah. us up in our process. And that's the kind of the sort of saving grace of our industry is that we'll still be needed to, to take it that last 10% to perfect. And I think the same could be said for even a strategist, right? Like it's a tool in our toolbox, just like, you know, um, Grammarly is a tool in our toolbox to make sure we spell things right. correctly. It's the same. It's the same thing. I don't think it's going to. And again, it's about feeding it the correct way and 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 mm -hmm. and and looking at the nuances or reading between the lines of what it's telling you. And I think that's where the skill set of you know having longevity in your career and being the subject matter expert that you are comes into play. Um, so the, the final the final question here, which you know I, I, I'm really anxious to to learn about, is. Um, you know, you're in Australia, you've been in London, you're global, you're everywhere. You're as a freelancer, you've had the opportunity to work with all different types of businesses and all different types of projects. But like, what is it that really, like, what's in, what, where do you draw inspiration from? Oh, other designers stealing your work. Oh, Back okay. to Austin Cleon again. No, I'm kidding. Oh, uh, I, do, I do, obviously. <laughs> I, I, yeah, totally, totally. Inspiration. But we all are. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard. I moved to Australia three years ago and had to sell my entire collection of books because I just couldn't bring them over. They were too heavy. Uh, my Logo Modernism book, which was a huge source of inspiration for me, is like a tomb. It was like half the size of my torso and weighed an absolute ton. Uh, I'm slowly building that back over the years. And I love logo design inspiration books. I love looking at other people's work and, for, and other designers as well. People like um, James Martin, Alan Peters, Aaron Draplin. I have all of their books in my on my bookshelf here now yeah. just looking at their work and their processes and i've learned from all sorts of other designers and taken bits and pieces from everybody i've taken the brand noun process from alan peters i've taken some creator creativity ideas from made by james james martin and just pieced that all together to build my own thing and the actual visual stuff is just from you know reference books and i was very lucky actually a, a few years back one of my three of my logo designs were included in a logo design inspiration book, um, which was amazing. You know, it sits on, sits on the shelf of um, creative designers um, all over the world. And I, I felt hugely um, um, proud to be as part of that book, especially as because someone, somebody like me is actually using books like this for inspiration. And there's other, there's other places like Dribble and Behance and, and things like that. Yeah. But there's no substitute for thumbing through a book. No, you're absolutely, I mean, I have a bookcase yeah. over here. I have an office full of books and, you know, like you, there, there is no substitute for just even Matt. Ma I love magazines. You know, for me, yeah. I get a lot of subscriptions, which is weird, right? Like my, my mailman, my postman must be like, what the hell's going on here? Because I'm getting everything from restaurant design and development to monocle to, you know, everything and anything travel and leisure. Uh, and, and, you know, for me, they, as I, as I skim through them, I'm just always like folding back pages or highlighting yeah. something or writing something in my notebook. Oh, that could be really cool here. Or this got to save this for later. And I kind of think, you know, as a creative and, and I'm curious to hear your, your, your take on this, but like, 
Um, I'm constantly like just writing notes to myself and like little reminders. And, and, and as a creative, I think that that's, that's just so important to be so observant and to be open-minded and open-hearted. Um, mm -hmm. and that's where I draw inspiration. Would you say that it's a little bit of the same for you? Yeah. Pr like print design is not dead, right? There's, there's no print substitute for, not for thumbing through a, uh, a book or a magazine to, to garner inspiration from. And, to, and as, as somebody who works predominantly in a, in a digital space, like my work is mainly up online and on websites, to hold it in my hand, there's yeah. no substitute for that as to have something tactile. And to, you know, I, I started off as a digital designer and then went into print later. So I've always felt like print is like um, still slightly uncomfortable for me. I'm not at home in it. Um, completely, and, and I recently did was part of the Print Design Summit and got to see some speeches from um, those guys, and it's fantastic to, to still learn and to feel like I'm still part of that yeah. space. But yeah, having getting to hold your design in your hand and other people's work is just there's, there's, there's no substitute for it. And speed well, as well. It's like thumbing through the book is just it's just so much faster to kind of get visual ideas and and to take references from. It's just. And, and I think the, you know the thing with books and like you know print pieces is like you're not going to go down a rabbit hole like you can on the internet where yeah, you get click on something and next thing you know you're someplace you shouldn't be it's a little naughty yeah. but you're there anyway yeah. and you like it like you, know, you don't need YouTube. that in your life. spiraling right I know uh, what you mean final final question speaking of print what was it like to get your cover on Brander's magazine and to hold that magazine like what, what was that feeling like fantastic a uh, huge imposter syndrome considering the people that have been you know part of this magazine i think christo was on the cover once and he's a yeah. hero of mine so to be up there with him uh and and you know the other um sort of designers and creatives that have been up there was was so amazing it's one of the, my sort of crowning achievements so That's awesome. thank you to branders for having me and for, for letting me be a part of that magazine it was a huge honor and um you know if you want to go check the article out it's it's live on the website and i wrote two pieces for the magazine and i felt like i was getting back to my roots writing articles uh, like i used to for like blog posts uh, which i haven't done in so long it was it was amazing right uh, uh, to be asked those questions and uh, yeah I was, I was really really proud so thank well, you well, well james you are incredible uh and i really appreciate you taking time out at 7 a.m oh. to chat with me uh, i wish we could share a pint together but that would just be there we go. utterly oh. irresponsible on both of our point parts at this moment <laughs> 7 a.m for me it's a little <laughs> early yeah uh tell everyone uh where they could find you online what your urls are and and all that good sure. stuff Okay, so my website is barnard.co. That's my um, sort of work website. And all of my socials are at barnardco. So you'll be able to find me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, you name it. Um, yeah, go follow me there. Check out some of the videos that I make around uh, software tips and tricks, how to be a better designer, how to be a better freelancer. I'm sure if you're a designer, you'll find some juicy content. There. Oh, I can guarantee if you're a designer and you're not following James that you will after this episode. Uh, for more on Branders Magazine, talking with Branders Podcast, go to brandersmagazine.com. Subscribe for the magazine. So subscribe on all of our social channels. And for more on me, well, my little place on the internet is stephenpaconza.com. So follow me there. Until next time, everyone. Deuces. Peace out. Bye.